Uh, hi, welcome. Uh, don't have too many people here. That's okay. I uh, mean, I think we got about 20 right now in the course. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is Derek Harder. This is Machine Learning. I think everybody's in the right place. Um, so, you know, um, as usual, kind of a light day. I will go over the kind of class structure today, what we're going to do. Um, I am going to get into, you know, um, uh, what you should be doing, getting uh, your Jupyter Python environment set up for assignments, some, some stuff like that today. So, uh, but let's just start with the usual stuff. Um, uh, if you haven't gotten into my Leo online, make sure that you do uh, check it regularly. Uh, so, I mean, just to let you guys know, I mean, I, I, I hope that I'll get people come into the face-to-face -face session, but I'm not really planning on taking attendance, not to mention that I'm actually also doing this uh, in conjunction with some people that are all doing it only online, which is why I started a, a Zoom session here. I'm going to try to, to record lectures and stuff, but uh, I hope you'll find these sessions useful. We will, I will mostly be using these to work on problems, you know, work on examples, sorts of stuff from the, uh, the, the program assignments we're going to be doing, things like that. Maybe a little bit of traditional lecturing, but, but more kind of just trying to get up problems, uh, IPython notebooks, doing code and stuff like that. So that's why I usually am most comfortable with doing in sessions like this. So I uh, hope people will find that useful and uh, uh, helpful and uh, want to want to come and see these sessions. So uh, let's start. Um, uh, I um, I am kind of I have done this course many times. I've got lots of content. I've, I'm reorganized a couple of things, so you won't see you might not see everything up there yet. So just uh, just you know keep that in mind. I will be repopulating some stuff as I uh, updated a bit uh, here and there, things like that. Um, if you haven't gotten in, uh, you know, make certain that you do check the course regularly. Uh, but I'll put all announcements, all materials, uh, all assignments and stuff will be will be through uh, the D2L course, right? So that that'll be where you'll go to get materials and data and announcements and everything. So uh, if you didn't find it, you can get the 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 full syllabus for the course. It is under overview. You have to pull that, open that up, um, and bring that uh, open here. Um, let me see if I make it bigger. So, um, so yeah, my name is Derek Carter. I mentioned that before. I will be the instructor. I've done this, you know, five or six times, probably more than that for this course. Uh, it's one of my favorites. My, my research area is kind of in machine learning. Uh, I usually am applying machine learning to analyzing data sets for uh, in more of human computer interaction kinds of things. So like eye tracking data sets, stuff like that. So I have some familiarity and some practical background on actually using, you know, building machine learning models for doing scientific studies, that kind of stuff. So um, um, I usually, I do have, I, my office hours are going to be eight to 11. You know, feel free to, to come in. Although, you know, um, uh, it is best to, to email me. Uh, I, I mean, I also uh, get pulled up to meetings and stuff during those times, uh, but I'll try to be there for those. I mean, uh, actually, I might be more like eight, 10 or so. And I have a class of 11, so I usually have to leave about 11, about 10, 15. So, but, um, uh, oh, and as I mentioned in an announcement, um, if you haven't started setting up the uh, uh, your Jupyter uh, development environment, you should probably get started with that. I I did get uh, one or two people from this class, about uh, four or five or six people to my my office hours, my uh, uh, hackathon uh, this morning, right? So if you haven't uh, started working on that, I will do it again Thursday. I mean, I will be office hours anyway, but our first uh, actual assignment for the class is next week. So you should get uh, working on that. Make sure you have something they can use both for the assignments, but also I'll be putting all of our le my lecture notebooks and stuff I use in class um, uh, up in there as another repository as well. You'll need a Jupyter environment uh, to run those and do those and stuff. So, um, um, at any time, if anybody has any questions, just uh, shout them out, raise your hand, whatever. So. Um, I mean, probably I'll try and um, uh, answer as fast as possible. If you email me, feel free to email me questions for this course. Um, um, as I um, mentioned, I think in one of the announcements, make certain that you are reading the announcements. Um, um, but uh, yeah, it, it is best to... Um, uh, stick in the CSCI 574 uh, in your title or just use the um, 
the email communication tool from D2L. Uh, that'll stick that on there for you, right? Um, so uh, because I have yeah, I have email filters and anything with 574 on there, I should see pretty pretty much immediately, right? As opposed to if you don't have that, it might kind of get scrolled down. It might take me a lot longer to to see it or respond to it. So, but yeah, feel free to email me and maybe try and use that trick um, uh, to make certain that it shows up on my particular box for my class emails and stuff. Um, so. Um, uh, I think I mentioned already, yeah, I, I usually just sit over to Science 355. I've got a lab over there. It's not bigger space. So I just, I like sitting there rather than my office up here in the journalism building. So you should find me there if you're trying to just stop by for a face-to-face -face serendipitous kind of uh, uh, thing to talk about stuff. Um, um, but yeah, you can always email. Um, so uh, I I say I need to update the text. Uh, I, if, if you can, it, really, the, the, it would be a good idea to get the most recent version of the hands-on machine learning, um, although don't sweat it if you already have the second edition. Um, there are a few changes, uh, but but uh, it should be fine. But I, I'm actually using the third edition. Uh, I, I modified the links. I just noticed that I didn't have those uh, linked correctly uh, in other places. I tried to modify those. Uh, I'll try and update the syllabus here. So uh, I really like this textbook. If you haven't gotten this already or, or looked at it, um, you know, it's, it's I, 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 I'm not really a mathematician, mathematical background. I, I tend to be more towards um, uh, application or, or, you know, programming. So, yeah, the hands on, I mean, you know, it, it is really kind of examples using scikit-learn and Keras in here. Um, um, so I think it's, 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 it's a good book to own. Uh, in fact, uh, um, here's my electronic uh, version of it. Um, just as a note, I mean, basically, um, let me see here. I don't know if you can see that very well or not. I don't know if it collapsed on those. Um, so basically, if you can read those, we um, uh, it also covers like neural networks and deep learning. We've got another course for that. So really in this course, uh, the, the stuff through the, the first nine chapters is basically what we do, um, uh, the machine learning, the actual content of this course, right? So a lot of my stuff for assignments and the things I talk about in your assigned readings will be uh, those first nine chapters. So um, um, yeah, we'll talk about classification and, and regression and we'll talk about um, um, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but, but this is uh, definitely, I think that most people should need to get this textbook and use do the reading and stuff if you want to do well in the course. Um, this, I mean, you didn't hear it from me, but you can probably pretty easily get the second edition of this text uh, just by doing some Google Foo. Um, if it's going to take some time before you can get a good, uh, a, a, a legal copy of it. But, um, but yeah, this, this is, uh, I recommend this one in your library, something that you might want to keep if you're at all interested in doing, uh, you know, data analytics, data science, machine learning, um, you know, as a kind of a career or anything related to that. Um, um, all right. And there are some other things. A lot of these, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's uh, the, the problem with machine learning is there's all, there's, there's all kinds of resources uh, that, that are good. Um, you know, some of these that I've, other things I've got up on here, um, um, I haven't used in a while, so I can't, uh, uh, Um, give full recommendations for all these. Uh, I've used some of these in the past. They're, I all thought they were good when I was using them. I'm not have looked at them recently. Although the one here, uh, our first two weeks, uh, we are using Python uh, and the Scikit-Learn uh, library. Python and some other uh, of the scientific Python staff is our main thing to concentrate on. Uh, if you don't know Python, I mean now it's, I find that a lot of people already have some familiarity with, but but that's okay. I do expect you to be able to pick it up. So I, we will, I will give you like a week or two where it's mostly, uh, we'll have one assignment that's really programming with Python and NumPy and stuff like that for these first two weeks. Um, I really like this textbook. It's free. Um, um, it's, um, um, it is Python programming, um, although also it, um, 
secondarily has things about you know computer science so um but um, um that's a good one but there's lots of other resources in fact if you ever find anything that you thought was really good for you send it my way and i try and collect these and, and put these in various places uh that people have found helpful um, but that's the one i recommend uh if nothing else uh when you're doing like this week and next week um uh covering the stuff on python programming and using numpy and stuff like that um, um i do already have some lecture videos about uh, that stuff um i'll probably be uh I'm, I'm covering um uh, repeating some of that stuff in the lecture videos in the class starting today and, and on thursday as well so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about getting set up here uh, after i'm done with the syllabus and then maybe get into python a little bit and, and probably wait for the next meeting or next week where we get in numpy and matplotlib and some other stuff like that um all right So uh, right now, um, uh, um, um, sorry, let me just go back through all these things. Um, I was going, I thought I had something in here. I, I, you, you do need to have your own kind of computing system. Uh, I see a lot of people have laptops here. That's great. I, I really suggest you bring those if you're going to come to the, the, the lectures and, and actually work along with the, uh, the the Python notebooks, lecture notebooks as we do them. Uh, if you have an issue, you probably do need a computer, um, you know, it's not more than a couple of years old uh, and, and at least four gigabytes. Uh, I would recommend more like eight gigabytes or so. And if you have access to like an NVIDIA GPU or something, uh, for this course, it might not. That, that's probably not a big deal. That's that's more useful for like uh, deep learning, neural networks, and stuff like that. But um, uh, but but uh, yeah, laptop or desktop, and you do need to get some stuff installed on there so you can do Jupyter notebooks and things. Uh, if that's an issue, let me know right away. I've got some other options uh, for people that we can try and get set up, including a virtual machine on a cloud or some other stuff like that. Um. All right. Um, at the moment, um, what I usually do on this course is just about an assignment about every other week. Uh, so about six or seven assignments. We got 15 weeks for a course. Uh, we, we'll have a midterm um, and a final exam. So we'll have two exams. They'll probably be through D2L, um, although it might be that you'll have a time to D2L, but you'll do some stuff in like an IPython notebook and submit the notebook or submit the code um, that you're working on. So uh, we'll talk more about those. Um, so those are worth usually about 40%. Um, um, so more, more points are for kind of more of the, the program assignments. And I, I often, and I'm going to do it this semester, I think as well. Um, um, and I'll talk, uh, start starting the midterm, I'll talk about that. But I, it's, it's more, I think of it more as like an open-ended assignment. So I say, okay, you know, we, you've learned some stuff about machine learning, pick a data set or something um, and uh, do a pro do, do some analysis on it and build a model of it. Um, um, see if you can do, how, well, you can do to do something for, for prediction or something like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if we, we break it down, usually that one is kind of like a worth about two of the, the normal six or seven assignments that I did. I might add some quizzes, although I'd probably do that as like just 5% uh, uh, for some readings if I can find some good things just to um, kind of like a, a, a self-study sort of um, kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I can find a good resource for that. I've been meaning to do that, but um, uh, so look for that. So, so I might also add in like, like a, a quiz over the reading and maybe I'll give you like two or three attempts. Uh, it'll be like some multi, like five or 10 multiple choice true false questions meant to just check that you did the readings and kind of understood the reading. So, um, but those are usually what I use kind of for the assessments, right? So it's, it's mostly doing the programming assignments uh, and kind of like a midterm um, and a final uh, exam, so maybe kind of a project, although project is maybe a little bit too strong. It's, it's more like a, a bigger, more open-ended assignment is what I think of it usually for this class. Give you a chance to 
uh, pick um, some machine learning um, algorithm that you're interested in or a data set and, and maybe show me kind of what you can do with it. All right. Um, any questions about uh, that kind of stuff? So, um, but uh, but yeah, so back to this, that um, uh, everything will be on D2L though. So, so all those assignments and stuff, announcements and things. So, so you definitely should be checking uh, D2L regularly. Um, 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 and um, like I said, uh, I'm reorganizing some things. So some stuff will uh, probably appear uh, just the week uh, when we're ready to start working on things. So, um, um, so, uh, Just looking at kind of the schedule. So like I already said, we kind of the first two weeks I do, uh, we don't quite get into uh, actual machine learning content. I kind of set aside just to, to ease in, make certain, you know, you know, if you already know Python, great, but you do have to do the first assignment. Uh, but but these are meant to get your environment set up. Um, um, and, and, uh, and if you're not familiar with Python, I, a lot of people know Python, but maybe there is some stuff about NumPy often and Matplotlib and things that, um, uh, and, and of, of course, I can learn. So, so then after that, though, uh, we'll, we'll get into the textbook. So starting with chapter two or three, um, and we have, if you look at the schedule, there's some readings. Uh, these are all from the hands-on machine learning textbook. Um, so probably next week, I'll start talking in general about what machine learning is and stuff like that from chapter one and so on. And like I said, I, I hope to maybe give it like a little uh, quiz, uh, just uh, to do kind of self-test uh, for the readings and stuff. Um, uh, but um, yeah, the way I, I basically kind of think about the course is we'll look at, um, um, uh, you're going to learn some practical stuff using scikit-learn for doing machine learning, um, but we'll do the standard kinds of things. Um, so we'll start with uh, what what classification problems are, um, um, and then we'll look at the uh, versus regression. So these are, I don't want to get into these uh, right now, but but these are kind of the two major categories of machine learning. So you can either do things where you classify, it's, 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 uh, I predict that it's ABC, or the, the easiest is binary classification. So you might have a, a database of emails um, and uh, you predict whether it's spam or not spam. That's, that's a classic classification problem. Versus regression is in the, uh, the, the the other kind of machine learning, uh, uh, supervised machine learning, where um, I might have some data like of prices of houses and attributes of houses, and I want to predict, given a house with two bedrooms at this location, what would be its selling price. In, in that case, it's not like yes, no, or I have stage one, two, three cancer. It's uh, a real value of numbers, what we're trying to make a model of. So that, that's the big, so those, that's really kind of the big thing. Uh, of machine learning. Uh, um, you're either doing uh, building a model to do classification or you can do a model to do regression. So we do that kind of the first half um, uh, and that leads us up to about the first, uh, the middle of the course at the midterm. Uh, and then after that, we get into some more, um, 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 what's a good word, the more, uh, uh, we cover the, the basics, but these are still really useful, right? So linear regression is not considered all that powerful uh, or logistic regression. So those are for doing basic classification. So th we look at methods that often in certain contexts will, will make better models, right? So we'll look at um, uh, K and N, support vector machines, decision trees. So if you don't know what decision trees are, are uh, like uh, forests, ensemble trees. Uh, those are actually can be very powerful in the right context in terms of building a model that uh, is is that can be well at predicting whatever you're trying to predict or model whatever data you're trying to do. So um, uh, we might I might add one or two more in there uh, if we uh, can fit them in. Uh, then after that, though, I spend usually about maybe a third or a quarter of the course on unsupervised learning. Um, so those are the the, the last two chapters of our machine learning textbook. So uh, we'll talk about that, but but, uh, but that can be really uh, useful to do um, um, uh, like PCA on a data set. And so so you'll learn about that.
Um, all right. What else? So I think I covered the basics. Anybody have any questions? Anything I need to clarify on structure, assignments? It sounds like okay. Okay. The exams will be connected. Yeah, and I, I won't have you guys come here for today. So it will be online. Probably time, but, but you'll go to D2L. Uh, you'll start it. You'll get 120, you know, two hours. And you'll have to submit some code, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, I, I, I am going to go into some more details about um, getting set up and mining and getting some Python and stuff. So, that's kind of my next thing here. Um, all right, so like I said, I'm reorganizing some things, so I hope that my um, instructions they might not be as clear as they should be or could be uh, yet. So, um, for one, I, I recommend doing this. So, so you, you do need to have a Jupyter environment set up uh, uh, so you can run uh, IPython notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, if you don't know what those are, you'll see those in a minute here. Um, I recommend using uh, what I'm going to show here. I'm not going to show you installing all this stuff. I'll just show you after the fact how you, you use this here. Uh, some, some things I probably don't have uh, yet written down. Um, but uh, one thing you can do is if you uh, follow these instructions for setting up uh, dev containers in VS Code, um, uh, and to do this, basically, you have to install three things. Um, you have to install Docker. So dev, what, what, this, what we're ultimately doing with this, this, this method I'm recommending is we're going to have a Docker container that's actually running Linux. But the reason why that's important is it's going to run Linux with particular versions of Python and all the scientific libraries. So if you use what I um, recommend, you won't, you'll be guaranteed not to have any problems with doing assignments and gradings and having incompatibilities with versions and stuff. Not to mention, if you've never done stuff with this, this is, this is becoming the standard way, you know? So uh, if I'm working on a project, I might get all my requirements, get it into a Docker container, uh, so I know that if I need to go back to it, it always has exactly what I need. If I want a different project, I'll, I'll do another Docker container with those versions and requirements. So it does take a little bit of upfront to do this. If you don't want to, it is fine. You can just install like a, a, a version of Python yourself, Anaconda, but uh, it will be your responsibility to make sure that you have versions that don't cause problems when you try to do assignments and stuff. And I'll talk some more about that in a second. So if you want to do this, uh, I recommend trying to do it. Um, uh, you need Docker. Most people don't have problems with Docker nowadays. They've, they've, they've made it. It should work on Windows, Mac. It should work on Mac, uh, old Intel or new Mac, Silicon, new Apple Silicon chips. Uh, it seems to be working on all that stuff now. Uh, if you just go there, uh, it's a standard installer. Just accept all of the, the defaults uh, when you run the installer uh, for Docker. Uh, if you're Windows, make certain that you do check. It, it should be set up to do this by default now. Make certain that you are using the, the Windows subsystem for Linux backend uh, for the Docker. The other thing, some people, um, I, I did have a, a help session hack on this morning. Some people, uh, Docker, um, I mean, it usually installs okay, but sometimes when uh, it starts up, it doesn't actually start running the Docker engine. So I, I recommend that when you, after you install Docker, start up the Docker desktop app uh, and check whether it's showing that the Docker engine is running or not. And if it's not, you might want to figure that out first before you move on to the next steps. Uh, uh, you know, uh, figure out how you get that running. One common thing is that you do have to have virtualization turned on. So this is probably only for uh, Windows people. I don't know if Mac and Tells. Um, so, so the, often in the BIOS, there's a setting um, that you need to enable uh, to do virtualization. So Docker and all this kind of stuff is a type of virtualization technology. If that's not turned on in your BIOS, that's one reason why Docker often doesn't start running or doesn't work right. Um, all right. So that is, like I said, you need three things. You need Docker. Uh, if you've never used Git, uh, I am actually, this is the big thing I'm trying to do, I'm going to move the assignments into using GitHub Classrooms. 
So, uh, you know, the purpose of this class isn't to learn uh, software development kinds of stuff like using Git or things, but uh, you will have to use that incidentally for this class, uh, for the assignments, maybe some other stuff. So you will need to have a GitHub account if you don't have one already. So just go there, sign up for an account. You have to provide an email. If you already have a GitHub account, that's, that's fine. Just, just reuse it if you want to. Uh, if you're creating one new or want to, um, I do. I would prefer that you use your Leo KMUC email address for the GitHub account for this class. It'll, it'll make things a little bit easier for some stuff. So, so if you're starting from new or you want to create one just for this class or for assignments for university, use your Leo KMUC email address if you can. So, so if you create that, and then also you have to install Git. Uh, some some things on this, um, you might already have it installed if you're like a Mac person. Um, um, so you can check if you open up a terminal, um, and, um, do like get version, uh, like if you're on Mac, um, if it says that, if, if that works and it shows you a version, you can prioritize that get installed. Uh, if you're on windows, it, it won't have get installed. So you will have to install like a windows, uh, operating, uh, uh, get on, on windows operating system. Um. I don't think my instructions are clear, but yeah, the link for to, if you want to go to the GitHub installer is uh, there, the here. Um, um, on this one, uh, also to, to, to use the GitHub classrooms, you do have to get uh, your GitHub account set up and you have to get a, a secure shell key generated um, and uh, configured correctly. So don't skip any of these steps. So whether you're Mac and already had Git or you have to install Git, um, uh, so install Git, make certain that the word, this is supposed to be done from the command line. So, so once you have Git installed and you're able to access it from a command line terminal, uh, you should do the config. I'll just list my global configurations here. Um, So, uh, but, but yeah, you'll want to run these config steps. Uh, the important, the, the only big part of that, and use your actual name, uh, this will show up when you commit your assignments uh, uh, in GitHub, the GitHub Classroom. But uh, especially make certain that your email address is the same one that you're using uh, in GitHub uh, that you're going to be using for the GitHub Classroom, right? So if you use your Leo email address, you need to config your Leo email address. Okay? The other thing is that if, if you've never done uh, use stuff with Secure Shell, uh, installing Git uh, on Windows, you should already have it again for Mac or Linux. On Windows, this will install the Secure Shell tools that you need along with Git. Um, um, if you do this, this generates a, a, a public-private um, Secure Shell key that you can use for uh, creating commits and pushing them to GitHub. You'll need to do that for the assignments. So what it'll put that into a directory. So my home directory on Linux here is here. So on Windows, it'd be like C colon users, your username, and then there'll be a, a directory called uh, .ssh. Um, so I just listed out my SSH directory. So if you do this, this key gen, um, uh, you'll have to find this .ssh directory. Um, and if you've never done this before, you'll only have, by, by default, it'll create something called ID underscore RSA and ID underscore RSA dot pub, where the ID underscore RSA is the private part of your uh, secure shell key and the ID and the pub is the public part. That kind of infers, right? Um, the, um, oh, and, and if you're like, if you're using like a file browser, a common, issue that people have is if you try to find this in like a file browser on Windows, it might hide. So, so directories or files that start with a dot are considered hidden or private. So you might do a setting to, to see those things. The other thing is the Windows file browser by default hides the extensions. So you might not be able to tell that you actually have two files because it'll show ID underscore RSA or show two ID underscore RSA, but it won't show you the file extension. So you won't know which one's the public one. But anyway, the, once you do this here, uh, what you have to do is, I'll just 
cat it out on my terminal here, but you have to, the, you can open it up in, in a editor or something, but you have to get the public version of the key and you have to copy this, make sure you copy everything from the very first to the very end. So I just do like control C to copy it. Uh, and then in GitHub, to get a key into GitHub, what you're looking for is um, uh, under your settings, if you go to up, the way I usually do it is I go to the upper right hand side. Um, so when you have your GitHub account, you can get to everything, your repository setting, but also including your settings. Uh, and this this is this is the settings is where you manage all your stuff, including your your keys, right? So um, to do the assignments, you'll have to add in a new key and paste in that public thing. So if I, I'm not going to do it here, but uh, if I wanted to, I'd just uh, do new key uh, and paste in my, my my text of my public portion of my public private secure shop key that I just jumped. Right. So once you do that, then uh, you should have that that key then in. Um, um uh, in uh github all right um so the um uh, don't skip this step then so this is important this test that you actually got that, that you have git set up and you have your github key working all right so if you've correctly gotten your public GitHub key that you're going to use in the GitHub, you should be able to secure shell from, again, from the terminal, do this command here. Um, like that. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and um, if you don't get a message that you've successfully authenticated, something something's wrong. Uh, you missed a step or, or you've got something misconfigured. You didn't get your public key in there. Uh, the first time you did, the other reason why this is important is if you do this in VS Code without doing this the first time by hand, uh, the very first time you connect, uh, it's going to say that it's never, it, it doesn't know, you know, it doesn't know that this is an actual valid host, right? And you have to answer yes the very first time. If you do this by hand from the terminal, you'll see that message and you answer yes, you'll be good. If you do it from VS Code, if you try to clone in VS Code first, you won't see that message and you'll be confused of why your secure shell key isn't working. So yeah, if you see that message, just say yes. Another thing, I don't know why, but sometimes it hangs here. So sometimes you have to hit return uh, before it continues on. Um, but yeah, if it doesn't seem to get that successful message, try hitting return or enter a couple of times. Um, and uh, and and then you should get that. Okay, Those, okay. Those are just a couple of hints of, of some things I've been seeing people have issues with. But if you can get that far, then uh, you've probably got your secure shell and your GitHub set up correctly. All right. And the other thing, um, um, probably actually, now that I've been using it and thinking about it, we, we probably don't have to have VS Code. You could probably just do this from Docker. I haven't figured out how to do that. But um, I mean, VS Code is a good thing to to, to learn the basics of anyway. It's become pretty standard. A lot of people are using it. Uh, not to mention that you can actually run uh, Jupyter Notebooks just in VS Code. You don't have to run like a Jupyter Hub server or something. So I'm probably not going to be showing you guys that. But that is another option, another way to bring up a Jupyter notebook um, and run code in it. So, but um, um, if you're following this, then go ahead and uh, install VS Code. And uh, I guess there's actually four. When inside of VS Code, VS Code is a uh, it's an integrated development environment. You don't know what it is, but it's really kind of more like a framework. So, like if I want to do development on C++, I'll add in some extensions for like a C++ compiler and C++ formatting. If you want to do stuff. Uh, so you have to add an extension to do remote development containers. So you have to find this extension um, and install it or add it to VS Code. So, and this will actually work with Docker to create a virtual Docker container that's actually going to be running uh, your, your Jupyter Hub server and have your code uh, so you can run Python, you know, and, and, and this will be set up. Um, so let me, let me show you, so if you get that far, the way to test this out um, uh, using VS Code uh, is like this. So um, uh, I've got a repository. I'm going to put all of the basic resources, lecture notebooks, maybe other stuff, data, and things like that is in here. 
you don't have you won't have right access to this, so you actually don't need the secure shell key for this. Uh, you'll need that for the assignments. But um, uh, if you open this up, uh, you'll see right now uh, the only thing I've got in there right now are the the notebooks for first week, unit one, and second week. So the things on Python programming and NumPy and Mac. All right. Uh, and uh, I'll add more stuff on this. Uh, uh, so so uh, I'll have lecture notebooks and other stuff will, will go in here, but uh, later on you'll have to do a get pull to pull down new stuff as I add it in there. Uh, but uh, so let me just show you uh, how you might do this. So if you have VS Code, if you have those, those three or four things installed, like I, I mentioned, uh, let me go ahead and... Um, and uh, let me close off this container. So here's how you would uh, use that repository, uh, assuming you've got your thing set up, like I just showed, um, uh, to do the lecture notebooks and get access to those materials. Um, so the way I, there, there's lots of different ways to do this, but the way I normally do this, I first clone the repository. So uh, like you can go over here to the file explorer in VS Code, uh, and if, if your Git is set up, you should have an option to clone a, a Git repository. So I'll do that. So here, um, the um, repository, uh, whenever you're cloning a repository from GitHub or, or some other repository of Git, uh, um, um, uh, usually there'll be some link where you can get the, the link for doing your clone step here. Uh, in this case, uh, you, I'm not going to give you access to be able to write or change stuff in here. So you have to clone using the HTTPS URL. This gives you read access, but it won't allow you to push or write things back in. But but you can read the stuff or download the stuff down. So I, I you know, so we just copy the HTTPS URL um, and clone that. And you could just do, do a git clone from the command line. Here, I'm going to do it uh, inside of uh, VS Code here. So I'd clone repository, paste that HTTPS URL. Um, And what this is doing is this is going to, it's going to clone the repository, which is really just a fancy, it's just downloading all the files from GitHub to somewhere on your host, on your local machine, okay? So you have to pick a location where you want the files to live. I'm going to put this in like a temporary directory. I, I, I usually put all my repositories in like a repos directory. Uh, I've already cloned this down to a repos CSCI 574 ML subdirectory for the, the class resources. I'm going to make another clone of this to temp, I guess, maybe. So I'll just put it in here. Um, so, uh, um, so this is actually just downloading all the files. Um, and you should, I, I want to open up that folder in VS Code. So if it asks you that, uh, so go ahead and say open it up. So I'm actually now I'm actually client, I'm actually running these uh, files um, uh, in VS Code, but I'm running them on my host machine, my local machine here. Right. So uh, like if you're on Windows, uh, you don't have access yet to all of the tools and stuff in the container, uh, and that just went away there. But but I want to reopen this in container. Um, but uh, let me show before I do that. Since I selected um, that I'm going to clone this to my temporary directory. Uh, you should be able to find it on your file system. So I'll open up my file browser, uh, look in temp, uh, and there's, uh, no, um, uh, where is it? <laughs> Not where I was expecting. Oh, class resource. So, yeah, so uh, uh, if you clone it the way I did, it's just going to be, the, the directory is going to be just renamed class resources. It's in a, it's in a um, organization called 574 machine. Learning, but uh, but that'll be the name if you don't specify something else that you'll get right. So on your local machine, after doing the clone, you'll find all the stuff in there, including the notebooks, right? So if you're running your own, if you install Jupyter Hub by hand instead of using a container, like I'm going to show you next, uh, you can still just clone it like I did uh, and and find the the notebooks there and run it some other way, right? Use some other Jupyter server, okay? Um, but yeah, the nice thing of using a, a Docker container or a dev container is uh, you, if you get that pop-up, that means you've got everything installed correctly. You can just, uh, 
uh, immediately say reopen in a container. If you miss that, um, I can always do something like, um, um, th there's lots of ways to do this. Like, uh, so if you have your, um, so I've got the, the, the dev containers uh, extension installed here. Uh, so, so having that installed, you'll have uh, the, uh, the a remote explorer. So this keeps track of all of the containers uh, that uh, you're managing through VS Code here, right? So if I wanted to, I could uh, uh, reopen that folder as a container. Um, so I could like like that. So that's one way to do it. So um, I, I'm I'm currently have this folder open, my class resources, uh, but it's open on my host machine. Um, so I could, I could reopen, uh, open that current folder in a Docker container. Okay. And if you're curious the way this works, uh, I don't know how if people that have done stuff with Docker before, the way this works is there's a directory called dev container that has some files that do some magic. Uh, a big one is like this one, this specifies all the stuff in the Docker file of all the packages and things to install. If I reopen this container, um, and uh, the other big one is the dev container JSON, which yeah, they they both basically are going to set up all the software that you need the way you need it uh, to do the assignments or, or to run the notebooks. Okay. Anyway, so back to this. Um, so since I missed that, um, I'll just try this. Hopefully, this will work. Um, so I'll, I'll reopen the current folder and container. It'll use that dot dev container uh, to figure out that um, um, uh, which operating system you use. So Linux in this case, uh, what stuff to install, including Python and particular Python libraries and things. So um, this may or may not be useful to you, but I usually open this up just to see. The first time you do this, um, it might take quite a bit of time. It has to download a bunch of containers and put them all together and download software and install things. Uh, uh, the, the, the second time you do this though, like, like when, if you do this for the class resources and then if you do it for assignment one, it's gonna be using the same container. So it'll probably go quite a bit faster for like the assignments uh, once you do this once. Um, uh, but yeah, for, for me already, we're, we're pretty much done here. So it's, it's actually finished doing the container. So I'm actually running uh, a virtual machine in Docker uh, that, that um, uh, here I can open up a terminal here. So you notice this terminal is running in my virtual machine, right? So my current directory is here. Um, and if you look, uh, you'll see that it's, it's really, it's, it's basically mounted the, that that directory that I cloned into for my host machine to there. So all those same files and directories uh, are, are right here now inside of the virtual machine. So I can also use them in the virtual machine, right? Including lectures, or you can see them from here. So so it, it reopened that folder in this container. So I, I now if you use the file explorer, uh, again, you'll see all these, including like the lecture notebooks and data and everything else that's in the class resource here, right? Uh, and, and the important thing about this is like, again, back to the command line here. Uh, so for example, I can see which Python, so by default, you know, installed Python, you do need to use 3.12. If you're using 3.10 or something, you might have problems. You might share in your 3.2 or newer. Uh, I don't, I think 3 point, sorry, 3.12. I think 3.12 is the most recent Python version right now. Um, uh, oops. You see that it's probably be a little bit too low. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it, it installed all. You probably should not, unless I tell you to. There, I think there might be one or two things I haven't gotten into the dev container yet. But you probably should not add or install any packages in this uh, unless you check with me first. Um, right? It should have everything you need. It, should, it, it has everything you need for the first assignment. I'll have to check uh, for the second and further assignments. 
Uh, and if it doesn't have that, I'll try and modify the dev container so it installs any additional package that we need, right? Um, so, uh, it, and, uh, so here, um, the way that I, you can run Jupyter Lab. It, it starts a Jupyter Lab server for you, uh, the way it's set up. So it actually is running Jupyter Lab in the container, um, and it's running it on port 8888, um, and it actually forwards that port from the virtual machine to the same port 8888 on your host machine. Right. So what that means is um, the, 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 um, this is what I'm doing right now. I don't know if this is this is the best way to do it, uh, but running the Jupyter server, uh, it, it creates a file called nohup.out. Uh, and uh, you can't just go to port 888 on your local machine. Um, so if I do that, well, you can. Um, so on my local machine, I can open up a browser. Um, and if you don't know what that IP address means, that means that's my home address. That's my local machine. So look on port 8888 for some web server on my local machine. Um, and it's running there. It's actually running on the virtual machine, but it's being forwarded to here, I hope. Oops, what did I do? Uh, it should be running there. <laughs> uh, usually it comes right up, and so there might be a problem here. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you get if you get that message, that means something something's not right. Uh, did I mistype it or something? Um, although I don't know, I'm not seeing. It. I might mistype it. Uh, but I, the reason why I normally just open that up is you actually have to um, uh, the way Jupyter Lab servers are working. Um, is for low security, it generates some kind of a, what do you call it, like a key or a token. Uh, and you actually have to use that token if you don't want to set up a password kind of thing. So I usually just uh, open up that file and control click on that. Let's see if that works. Hopefully it does. Control click on that to open it up. Mm. And it doesn't seem to be running here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it does. I don't know what I did on the previous window, but um, so that's what I'm doing right now. Um, VS Code, uh, reopen in a container, and it'll set up the container using the instructions in the dev container subdirectory. Then you can look in this NoHop file um, and uh, you can control click or copy paste that URL so that you can run the notebooks in Jupyter Lab, um, uh, the, the, the Jupyter um, uh, Lab server that's, uh, that's running for you. All right. All right, uh, let me know if I'm going too quick. If you have any questions, jump up. Let me clarify anything, all right? So if you get this far, I, you should do it because uh, you wanna, I, I hope that you'll find the like the lecture notebooks and other stuff I put in here are useful, right? So if you do this, then you'll be able to, so, so I'm, I'm asking you to um, uh, uh, either review or learn the basics of Python. So my lecture videos uh, go through uh, unit one, one, two, three notebooks. So there should be, I checked all these, they all do seem to be running. Um, so I can open up the notebook, restart it, rerun all the cells, see if they're all running or not. See, and, and uh, uh, any notebook I give you, any notebook that you do for assignments, you should, uh, they should always run cleanly, all cells from top to bottom. That's one thing I'll be kind of mentioning for assignments. So, so to check that is what I usually do. I, I just use that there. That that's um, um, a key, a shortcut to it restarts the kernel and it reruns every cell, right? And and if 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 some cell fails uh, and you're not running all the way completely from top to bottom, that means that you've got something wrong in your assignment notebook. So, so you should check that before you submit your assignments for this class. Um, So uh, anyway, probably on Thursday, I'm, I'm, I might go. Through, I've got some lecture videos, these same notebooks. I might talk some more about these on Thursday as well. I don't think we'll have time to get into today, but but those are out there. So there's the basics. Um, um, uh, oh, functions like you know how do you write a function? How do you do a loop, a for loop, or a while loop? That kind of stuff. Uh, how do you do variables and things like that? That's, that's the kind of stuff you should 
know the basics of to do Python in this class. Um, uh, and then the second one is really, you know, Python is a, is a high level language. So it's got some really high level, powerful kind of data structures. So, you know, uh, not only do we have like lists, which are kind of like arrays, but more powerful, but we got sets and uh, dictionary and we got queues and stacks and any other kind of things that you might want for a, 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 a data type, a data structure. Uh, and lots of other stuff. So one of the one of the powerful things about Python is its um its library of of, of stuff that you can use. It's got all kinds. It's got the the everything in the kitchen sink, like they say. Um, uh, lots of stuff written for you at a high level, so you can be very productive using Python. Um, and then functional programming. Um, Scikit Learn uses uh, concepts from object oriented. Pro, um, a viewpoint of, of doing tools and also from functional programming. So, um, so yeah, there's a little bit about function, fun, what, what we mean by functional design or functional programming in there. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice already, sorry. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's, that's what's in there right now. And then uh, next week, uh, we, we'll do some stuff on NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, um, that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, let me see. I'm. I'm um, we still got. Yeah, we still got quite a bit of time. Um, so, any any questions on that before I kind of go on some other stuff? Start the helping. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, there was one more thing I definitely wanted to show. So um, um, in the lecture subdirectory, are, I'll put all the lecture notebooks. Um, I will add more. I mean, you know, so once we get before we get to week three and four and stuff, there'll be more uh, in here. Um, um, there is one kind of utility one. Uh, I already posted this as an announcement, uh, but... Um, Sorry, um, <laughs> I meant to open that in Jupiter Hub. Uh, yeah, like I was just showing that there. Um, I mean, um, yeah, you, I mean, you can do notebooks inside of um, um, VS Code, which is what I'm doing here, and you can actually run them. Although you might have to install some extensions, I haven't tried that yet. I know some people like uh, doing notebooks in VS Code. You can try that out. Um, uh, th uh, uh, they sh they should be using the container, so it wouldn't matter. You could use VS Code to edit and run the notebooks, or you can use the Jupyter Lab server that's run like I was showing there. Um, so uh, in notebooks, there's a real simple, um, I posted this as an announcement. So yeah, if you're gonna try not to use the container, uh, it is your responsibility to have at least these versions, you're probably okay if, if there's a, like a, a newer version, but you know, if you're using 3.10 of Python or 1.4 of scikit-learn, you're risking having problems. So you might want to check that if you're not going to try to use uh, the environment that I've set up here for the class. All right. Um, let's see. And, and again, you know, I uh, encourage you, you know, to, to try and get that up today, tomorrow. If you're having issues with any of the stuff, Docker or whatever, um, um, uh, my next face-to-face -face is, yeah, next Thursday. Feel free to come by then if you have time or just email me. I can often give a little bit of diagnosis help uh, through email. Um, okay. So... Well, I'll move on then. Um, I, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about Python, uh, maybe for 10 more minutes, since we've, we've still got about uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes here. Um, oh, actually, maybe the most useful, if you've if you've never used, I, I like JupyterLab, uh, especially for doing fast prototyping and stuff like that, JupyterLab, JupyterHub. There's actually a difference. I tend to kind of use that interchangeably, um, but um, this interface. Um, so uh, 
kind of like a lot of programs like VS Code, you know, you've got basic uh, functions on the left-hand side. So you, uh, you've got a basic Explorer or file browser, right? And this opens up at the root of the repository that you open your container up. So you'll see um, um, all those directories, um, subdirectories, notebooks, lectures, and things that we currently have in the class resources. Um, you can control your uh, kernels. You can stop and start kernels and see which tab and stuff you have open from this one. So, um, I mean, uh, I sometimes need to use that in order to, uh, if I need to stop, get all these kernels and restart some stuff, I just shut down all of them, get rid of all my running kernels. So every, every um, IPython notebook or Jupyter notebook, when you start running it, it has to start a separate process, which is called a kernel. And that kernel is basically got Python running in it and, and other stuff, right? So, but that's the thing that gets called in order to run the cells uh, and, 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 and uh, produce the output that's displayed in the notebooks. So, um, you have um, this uh, is useful. Um, uh, so this shows you an outline. This uses, again, a little bit about notebooks here. If you've never used them, um, there's two main kinds of cells in a notebook. Make certain you know the difference. Uh, so I might ask you to uh, write a um, uh, write something like a write a description or um, uh, give me uh, an answer in English to a question. Right. So you shouldn't be using code cells. Uh, you know. So if I ask you to write something for an assignment. Um, uh, you don't want to use a code cell to do that, right? So code cells are meant only for code. Um, um, so besides code cells, like here, you've got uh, what are known as markdown cells. Markdown cells are what you want to use if I want to write descriptions, right? Uh, English text, right? Um, and uh, to jump back even further, uh, you know, a notebook is meant to be kind of a readable, executable document. So it's good practice to not have just code, but to have interspersed, you know, code descriptions with uh, de descriptions of what you're doing, and then the code uh, giving examples of that, right? So and that's what you'll see in the lecture notebooks that I have um, uh, here for the class, mostly, hopefully. Um, but um, yeah, you can uh, edit markdown. So the reason why I'm kind of mentioning this, so this is also tied. So in scientific documents, you know, like publications for journals, things like that, we usually use, uh, a, you know, a, a structured kind of thing, you know, so we have an introduction and then a, a method section and stuff like that, right? So, so most scientific publishing, you need to have the, the way you do that in Markdown or Markdown languages is, uh, for one, you use uh, level headers, right? So a, a pound means a level one header uh, in Markdown. Oops. Um, two is a level two header. Three is level three. And so on, right? Um, and if you want to execute a cell, uh, I mean, you can do like the run button that'll work both for, you know, uh, um, it's, it's more for uh, code cells. Yeah, so it looks like it automatically read that there. So, but anyway, if you hit sh shift enter, um, it'll execute um, the cell that you're currently in. Um, but you'll notice on the outline that uh, that now we've got the 1.1, 1.11, right? So that that's all controlled by these kinds of headers. And then, you have other kinds of markdowns, so you can uh, you know, do bold and italics, and you can make lists and all that kind of stuff, right? So again, markdown is a good tool. It's becoming a standard kind of thing. Uh, lots of stuff you'll find uh, uses markdown, and you can use those in these notebooks too. The, the, the thing I find it most valuable is, yeah, creating a good outline. So, you know, instead of trying to scroll around and find stuff, you can go over here uh, and get directly to the different parts uh, of the notebook that you need, right? So in this notebook, you know, we start with introduction, then we go through the arithmetic operators and so on, variables, functions, stuff like that, right? Um, so, yeah, so there's code cells, uh, there's markdown cells, and then there's code cells. Um, so I... I, I I don't know all the keyboard shortcuts and stuff, so I'm not, I don't use uh, uh, um, IPython notebooks 
to become a real power user, but a couple of things that I use a lot. Um, you can always find the stuff here or in the file menu or in the, the, the drop down menus to do things. Um, um, there is, um, if you look at the um, keyboard shortcuts, uh, you know, these, these might be some useful stuff to you to, to, to kind of power up, uh, become more productive with, with notebooks. Um, so, like, for example, I, I use uh, run selected cell um, uh, using shift enter or um, uh, run selected cell and do not advance using control enter a lot. So, for example, here, so getting some Python, right? So, so Python um, uh, allows you to write expressions using uh, operators like arithmetic operators and Boolean operators. So if I want to have an expression like that, do an addition operator. If I do shift enter, um, it'll actually run that. Here, let me go ahead and um, I use uh, restarting the kernel and clearing the outputs uh, when I want to get everything uh, cleaned up uh, and restart from the beginning. All right. So uh, and another thing, uh, again, there's probably keyboard shortcuts for this. But uh, uh, if I if I do that, uh, I might want to run everything above that and then start uh, doing my work from this point on. So I might do a, a, a run. Uh, everything above, uh, run all above my current selected cell. So that will do my imports or any, anything above there, right? So now I can do this, the, these cells here, right? So you can use uh, shift enter, uh, will actually execute the cell. So notice that the output uh, happened when I execute that cell. Or control enter um, also executes, but it leaves it in the cell. Uh, it leaves that cell um, uh, as the current cell. So I can try different things, oops, I guess not, <laughs> um, uh, but keep rerunning it. Um, so anyway, there, there's those. Uh, 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 another thing I use, I mean, it, it does allow you to, uh, uh, VS Code, you can do the same kind of things. It, so you, can, you can arrange pain and stuff uh, to make it useful. The, one of the things I use a lot for that, let me show you, um, uh, is the contextual help. Um, let's see. Let me run everything above this. So if I wanted to get help on the, uh, the, uh, this function type that we're using here, um, we can uh, go to the help and show the contextual help here. Uh, this might not have very good, be a very good example, but um, um, Here, depending on uh, what you have currently highlighted, uh, it will change the contextual help. So since I was in this function type, uh, this is a built-in function, so it doesn't really give you uh, some very good documentation, but this could be very useful for like scikit-learn um, and some of the other libraries. They'll have better documentation about, you know, what parameters the function takes and all that kind of stuff if you use contextual help. Let me see if I have a better example here somewhere. Um, like maybe math, maybe some of the math functions might uh, have some better. Um, so let me run everything above this. And let's look at the math sign. Again, not, not to, uh, so this can be more useful for other things, uh, some of the built-in stuff, maybe not, but um, yeah. So this, this is basically whatever is in context, uh, you can have your contextual help up there. Uh, and sometimes I'll give you more information about what the parameters are and what's going to do and what it returns and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I use that a lot. Um, and uh, what else? Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of any other stuff that, that I want to bring up that I can think of as good advice right now for the lecture notebook. So I'll leave that there. Um, we've only got 10 more minutes, but, um, yeah, I don't want to try and force anything. So, uh, yeah, I, I encourage you before Thursday, 
to get this far uh, and start, you know, make certain that you can run notebooks like that. So don't just read these, like these notebooks uh, and other resources I give, you know, actually run them, try things out. Uh, you may or may not need it for Python, depending on how much, how familiar you are with the language. But later on, once we get into scikit-learn stuff, it's really useful to have an interactive notebook like this and to actually change things and, and try see what happens if I change these parameters or that kind of stuff, you know. So that, that's the most useful thing, in my opinion, uh, to having these kind of notebooks for material that you're trying to learn. So, um, all right. Yeah, that's it. Any, any other stuff I can get to or clarify? If not, I'll just go ahead and end a little bit early. Let you guys go. I'll stick around. If you're a little bit shy, I want to come down and ask uh, face to face. But otherwise, yep, that's it. I'll see you. Hopefully, I'll see you guys again on Thursday. Uh, I'll, we'll, well, I'll start talking about Python and stuff on Thursday, um, and probably talk about the first assignment, maybe beginning then too. All right.